I don't make movies intellectually. I don't make movies to make a point. I make movies to tell stories about people. totally convoluted thing with the EMI and they decided to take a foray into uh, into movies and uh, they only made three I think and this was one of them and this is the one they expected to be the least successful and turned out to be the most. Hey Nick, did you ever come back? From that? Yeah. So I just came up with this idea as a deer hunter and I made a one hour presentation verbally which I was used to doing at that time. And uh, you often did that. You went into a studio head and you told them the story because they hate to read. I mean, they still hate to read. They always hated to read. Uh, Dino De Laurentiis says, I never read the book until after I make it the movie. <laughs> like this happens every goddamn day. You're full of shit, Harry. Who did you say was full of shit? You're full of shit. You're always full of shit. I'm starving. I said, look guys, uh, if you want to do it when you want to do it, I have to prepare the movie at the same time. I have to cast it, I have to scout it. I've got to go all over the world. I've got to go to Thailand, I've got to go here, I've got to go there, I've got to go to the mountains, or, you know, steel mills, I've got to... I'm going to be on the road. I, I need some help with the screenplay. I can't do it all by myself. So. I brought in a guy I knew from New York. I immediately went out on the road, and he was supposed to be working off my premise that I presented in front of Dale Olson. And I call him every single night from the road, from Ohio and from Pittsburgh and from steel mill towns and from East Chicago. And I mean, for example, I called him the night I went to a Serbian wedding uh, in Ohio, and I saw the uh, bride and groom drinking from that double cup that John Savage does, and sp if you spill a drop, you both drink, and it's bad luck, and if you don't, and of course he spills a drop, I says, listen, I saw a great thing, you've got to put it in the script, and I was giving the dialogue and everything, and I was giving him everything verbatim on the phone at night, and when I came back, and I read it, and I just could not believe what I read. It was written by somebody who was mentally deranged, and I went to see him at the Marquee, totally stoned on scotch and out of his frigging mind. I said, how could you get it so wrong? I said, I was calling the dialogue into you at night. And he started crying and screaming and yelling, and he said, I can't take the pressure, I can't take the pressure, because we were under the gun, we had to get the script ready. And uh, I have to go home, I have to go home, he's like a big baby, you know. And I said, well, pal, here's a ticket waiting for you, pick it up tomorrow. And then I had the awful chore of writing the screenplay myself because we sent him home after six weeks. And I had to write the thing on buses, on trains, on cars, at night in motels, and I mean, I worked like a dog. You know, nobody can say they wrote a three and a hour, 45 minute movie in six weeks with the depth of the deer hunter. It's impossible. Well, what's it like over there? Can you tell us anything? Okay. The first person we approached was De Niro. He's the only one who saw the script. And he insisted before he committed to seeing the location. So I had to take him to all the steel mills. I even had him sleep over a steel worker's house. And the guy who plays Chuck, the big guy, he was actually a guy showing us around a mill in East Chicago. Uh, he didn't have any idea of even who we were because I introduced, a, introduced Bob as his agent. Harry Eflin at the time. This is Harry Eflin. And then we went to a steel workers bar afterward, you know, and 
and because uh, they're open 24 hours, because the mills are going 24 hours on three shifts. And uh, Bob leans over to me, you know, and he says, Mike, uh, why don't we put this guy in a movie? So I said to Chuck, his name is Chuck Asperger, and I said, Chuck, how'd you like to be in a movie? He said, what? He said, who are you guys? <laughs> it was like a line from Butch Cassidy. I said, well, there's Robert De Niro, and I'm, he said, no, shit. Uh, he said, yeah, we'd like you to be in this movie. He said, well, fuck. He said, if you guys are crazy enough to ask me, I'm crazy enough to do it. I was hoping somehow, Michael, maybe you had Nick with you. And then I saw Merrill do, on three days' notice, Breck's Happy End. She replaced Shirley Knight at the Brooklyn Academy, and very few people know how well she dances and sings. I mean, she should have done Moulin Rouge. She would have been fantastic. And then I saw her, I said, Meryl. You marry me? Yeah. You would? And then we were casting uh, for the part of uh, Nick, and we must have seen thousands of people. And we were at the William Morris Agency in New York, and my partner, Joanne, and she said, here, she had a little piece of paper, and she folded it up, and she said, stick this in your pocket. I said, what is it? She said, just stick it in your pocket. Don't, don't. So I looked at hundreds of actors that day. I was so dragged. We went from 7 in the morning till about 9 or 10 o'clock at night. I saw so many people, I couldn't remember who was who. And at the end of the day, I had the most stupendous migraine, and I said to Joanne, I said, Joanne, I don't know, who, is, who should be Nick? And she said, you know the little piece of paper I gave you? I said, yeah. She said, well, open it up. So I had to search for where I put it, open it up, and it says, Christopher Walken is Nick. All right. All right, you guys, whoever took my boots, I want them back. Well, John was wonderful, you know, because he was dying of cancer. And he and Merrill were boyfriend and girlfriend, and they were devoted to each other. On the set, Merrill was present every time John was shooting. And John wanted to do it because he wanted to act with Bobby because even though they had been in Godfather, they never had a scene together. So he wanted to do it, but he was reluctant because he knew he was dying. And he said, Michael, I have cancer. I said, I don't care, John, they have cancer. And he said, okay. He said, if you're willing to take a shot, I'll do it. Hey, Mike, let me borrow your spares, huh? Your extra pair? No, Stan. No? And just before we started shooting, the morons at EMI, these so-called producers, just before we start shooting, these idiots come to me and say, you know, you've got to fire John Casal. And I said, why? And they said, well, you know, he's got cancer, and uh, he might die in the middle of the movie. I said, I'm not going to fire him. I said, if you fire John, you fire me. I'm out. Forget it. They said, well, then you have to write another script. I said, what are you talking about? They said, you have to write an alternative script. I said, what for? They said, in case he dies. Can you imagine? And they said, uh, in case he dies, we have to, uh, you know, be able to shoot around him dying, explain it. So I cobbled together some absolute dreadful piece of shit, you know, and I gave it to them, and that made them happy, and we did the movie, and God bless John, he finished it. Sadly, he died shortly thereafter, you know, and uh, Merrill spent the last month, I think, in the hospital with him, and it was one of his great performances, and he was a lovely guy to work with. I had the greatest admiration for him. This is this. What the hell is that supposed to mean? This is this. I mean, is that some faggot sounding bullshit or is that some faggot sounding? Hey, shut up, Stan, will you? And there was one really great uh, anecdote when Bobby comes back from Vietnam and they go back up hunting. And he's with John. And John starts fooling around with a revolver and starts kidding around about Russian roulette. And Bob, of course, has come from this dreadful thing over there with Chris Walker. And he freaks and he puts the gun to John's head. So we're getting ready to do the scene and Bobby comes to spring and he said, Mike, he said, you know, I think I could do the scene better if um, we put a real round in the gun. <laughs> I said, I beg your pardon, Bob. He said, shh, 
He said, don't I? He said, I, he said, I just think I could do a better job if I put a, we have a real round in the gun. I said, Bob, we're playing Russian roulette. He said, yeah, but you could rig it, you know, and do something. I said, well, I have to ask John. He said, okay, ask, ask go games. ask. And uh, go to John. I said, John, um, I got a weird request from Bob. He said, what is it? I said, he'd like to put a, a live round in the gun. He didn't bat an eye. He just said, he, he always had this incredibly thoughtful look, and he said, well, he said, okay, I can go along with that. Hey, big shot! <laughs> but that was John Casale. He was, he was just the sweetest guy for sweetheart. Oh! I do have a buried in my files. I mean, I do have some clippings, press clippings, from newspapers in Singapore that this actually took place during the war. But more importantly, you know, I mean, they say it was true and everybody says it was, you know, purely invention. And I, I think that's beside the point. My real, the real point I had using it was how do you dramatize war? The main element of combat is waiting because a firefight usually is fierce, unbelievably insane, and is over in a very short space of time. And then you're either dead, you're a paraplegic, or you're alive. One of the three, there's no in between. And it happens like lightning. The rest of the time, you're waiting for random death. So, as a purely dramatic problem, how do you demonstrate the terror of waiting for random death? How do you do it? You can't do a, uh, an Andy Warhol thing like sleep, showing 12 hours of somebody sleeping. You can't show 12 hours of somebody w waiting. I mean, they're only the theater. Now, what better way to show the tension of random death on Russian roulette. Because you don't know. It, one pull of that trigger and you're gone. <laughs> well, you're not. It's as close as I could come to dramatically being as powerful about combat, real combat, as possible. <laughs> One funny incident was, you know, when the guys escaped down the river on the log. We sped down the river, and the log was flying literally to the South China Sea in free fall. And we caught up with the raft, and I said, Bobby, get on the goddamn log. Chris, get on the log. John, they clambered out of the boats onto the log, and I told Vilmos, I said, just start fucking rolling the cameras. Roll the goddamn cameras. And he started rolling the cameras, and then no sooner did he do that that the raft got caught in a whirlpool and started rotating, going in circles. And the boats are going in circles. We're trying to stay out of each other's way. And in the middle of all that, suddenly, because the teak is so damn heavy, it's like a hunk of iron, the bamboo undercarriage cracks in half. So the four ends are sticking out of the water. And we're spinning around, and the boats are spinning around. So three stuntmen, the stunt coordinator, two stunt guys and myself, dove into the quai, and we each 